We have been uh, on a five-week series of the book of Colossians, and this morning we come to the final chapter, and that is the fourth. Uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let me introduce you <clears throat> excuse me, to these people here. Joseph is mine and Susan's older son. Christina is his wife, <clears throat> so she's our daughter-in-law. <clears throat> and uh, Joseph and Christina used to live in Massachusetts. <clears throat> and while there, uh, Christina had a job, and her boss was Mike. And Mike had a daughter, Megan Ann. And one day, Mike told Christina... My daughter, Megan Ann, lives down in Chicago. Her old car just died. She needs to replace it with another car. And Mike said, she doesn't know anything about cars, and I feel compelled to fly down to Chicago and help her get another car. And the problem is, I don't know any more about cars than Christina does. <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> Christina said, well, my father-in-law lives down in Chicago. He knows, a lot, he knows a bit about cars. Maybe he can help. So uh, Christina put Mike in contact with me, Mike asked, would you help me and my daughter pick out a good car for her? And I said, sure. So on the phone, I found out when he was going to be down here, and I said, okay, at a certain day, at a certain time, I want you to meet me at this address, Honda of Lyle in Lyle, Illinois, a little suburb uh, west of Chicago. And so the three of us met, uh, introduced ourselves to each other, we'd never met before. We went into the dealership, now it's a big dealership, Lots of tables where customers sit, lots of customers walking around. The three of us sit, and I asked Christina, what kind of car are you looking for? How much money do you have to spend? And uh, I said to the father and the daughter, now I'm going to go get a salesman and bring him over here. Do you all want to negotiate the price for the car? Do you want me to do it? And they said, oh, you negotiate. We don't want to do this. You help us out. And I said, uh, <clears throat> okay. Now, I want you to know that when I have decisions to make, and buying another car is a pretty big decision, when I have decisions to make, I don't do this by myself. I ask God's help. I pray about it. So before I go get a, uh, before I go get a salesman and bring him over here, I want to pray. Now, they didn't say anything, but they looked at each other, and on their face, again, they didn't say anything, but on their face it was like they were saying to each other, did I hear him right? Did he say he wants to pray? What? Out here in public with people walking around, they're going to be looking at us? Then they turned to me, and, and Mike said, well, if you think prayer help, okay, go ahead and pray. <laughs> and I found out they're both non-Christians. Now, they were members of a church, but they didn't go, and they weren't Christians. I, I would later talk to them about Christ. They didn't, know, they didn't have a clue. And... Uh, by the way, I want you to know that Megan has given me permission to use names here and tell you this because it turns out real well. But uh, So I just said it in a brief prayer. Lord, this young lady needs another car. Now, God, you know every car in greater Chicago that's available. My request is, would you please lead us to the right car at the right price for her? Amen. So I went and got a salesman. He came over here. And he showed uh, Megan lots of pictures of what they had available. And she said, I like this kind of car. And I like this, uh, this color. And so now I begin negotiating with him. <clears throat> and we, we go at it for a while. And so finally, uh, I'll make him an offer. And he said, okay, uh, uh, that looks like a pretty good offer, but I don't have the authority to sell it to you for this. Let me go check with my boss. So he goes to check with his boss. And I tell Mike and Christina, now the boss is going to turn that down. I deliberately made a low offer so we can come up a little bit. But they're, they're not going to like that, that price. And the salesman comes back and says, um, my boss has agreed to sell the car to you for the offer you made. I couldn't believe my ears. <laughs> and so the salesman said, uh, okay, so you want to buy the car? And I said, no. I said, I'm going to take, the, I'm gonna take uh, the dad and the daughter to two or three other Honda dealers now that I know... Um, Okay, Sue's giving me a signal. Sue, did I say the wrong thing? It's, it's, it's not Christina, it's Megan Ann. Megan Ann, okay. All right, so Mike is the dad, Megan Ann is the daughter. I, I might have mixed that up. Thank you so much. Um, 
And so I said, no, I'm going to take uh, the dad and the daughter to two or three other Honda dealers now that we know how much you'll sell it to, see, to for how much you'll sell it to us for. I'm going to see if we can get a better deal from another Honda. And he said, whoa, wait just a minute. Let me go talk to my boss. So he goes and talks to his boss and he comes back and he said, I'm going to make you an offer so you won't even need to go look at another Honda dealer. And he made an, another offer. I couldn't believe my ears. I didn't think he would take my offer. Now he drops it down even more. And so Megan bought the car. And when the three of us walked out, we felt like thieves. We felt like we stole that car. Okay, so now I, I did my job. I did what they asked. I helped the dad help the daughter get a car. Now he's about to fly back to Boston. Um, and I said to Megan, now, if you ever need help again, since your, your parents are up in Massachusetts, if you need somebody here to help you over some issue, don't hesitate to call me or my wife. We'll be glad to help you um, in the absence of your parents. And I didn't think I'd ever hear from her again. Oh, four or five months later, she called me up just down cast. Her boyfriend broke up with her and she was thrown in deep despair. And she wanted to know if soon I would meet with her. So we arranged for her to come out to our house. And I want you to know, that when she arrived and got out of the car in the driveway, she was wailing out loud. She was so unhappy, so miserable. And the neighbor across the street turned his head and looked. He heard her wailing, and he must have thought, what in the world is wrong with her? So we took her in for one hour. We let her talk. Let a hurting person talk and get it out on the table before you so you can see what you're dealing with. What's the issue? What's the solution? So she just got it all out, weeping and weeping and weeping. Now for the next hour, Sue and I talked. We had one objective, to leave her with hope that things in her life could improve, that they could get better and link the hope to Jesus Christ. And uh, so as the hour came to a close, I, I just sensed uh, by the expression on her face and her voice, she was beginning to have a little hope in her, in her dark soul. And I said, uh, now Megan, I want you to do three things. This is very important. I want you to take one minute every day and talk to God in prayer. Then I want you to take five minutes every day and read scripture. And I want you to start with the book of Thessalonians and just take five minutes to read thoughtfully. And then once a week on Sunday, I want you to go to church. Now, uh, this, these, these three things are very important. You go to any church you want to, but a minute of prayer, five minutes reading the Bible, go to church. She started doing that. And then after some months, to my disappointment, she moved back to Boston, but she kept in touch with us. Then one time she sent us an email and said, I have got to talk to you and Sue as soon as possible. She called us up. Oh, this is wonderful. She said, I want you to know I have been born again. I got back to Massachusetts. I kept praying daily. I kept reading my Bible and I kept going to church. I went from church to church. I eventually went to a church where they preached the gospel. And I can remember what you and your wife told me. I didn't fully understand it when you all told, it, told me, but it became crystal clear from this new pastor. Now, I understand the gospel. I've embraced Jesus Christ. Long story short, she began to grow spiritually like a weed. And God eventually led a wonderful man into our life, Daniel. They have a wonderful marriage, three little young sons in a Christian church, and they are serious, outspoken witnesses for Jesus Christ. Now, our pastor today is going to touch on evangelism. We should all be engaged in evangelism. God used some human being, human being to bring the gospel to you and me. Now, maybe that human being wrote a hymn. In my case, I became a Christian through a hymn. I never met the man because he died after he wrote it. But I'm going to meet him in heaven. He's one of the first persons I want to meet up there in heaven. It was through his hymn that the gospel came clear to me. Or the person that God used for you may have been a preacher. Or it might have been you were reading scripture written by some human being a long time ago that God used. But God uses people to bring the gospel to us in some manner. And all of us are saved to be witnesses and tell other people about Jesus Christ. And our pastor today, again, touches on um, evangelism. 
uh, Megan Ann, uh, she, she's just doing so well, and she began at the bottom of despair, uh, depression. She just had no hope, uh, but the Lord just uh, revived her in that. Now, we've been working our way through Colossians, and Paul is the purpose. Paul took a pen in hand and wrote this little letter is to deal with heresy. That is theological error. Um, preaching Christianity that is not in accord with the teaching of Scripture. And Paul is saying about the heretics, they are not holding fast to the head Christ, from whom the whole body, Christian church, uh, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God, not holding fast to the head. Now, years ago, a young lady at Moody, one of our students came to my office, and she said, uh, last year was just awful. I fell away from God. I, I went into the world. I, I, I dabbled in sin. And I was, the more I went into sin, the more unhappy, the more miserable I became. And she said, God, I've had enough of this. I, I just, the, my, the pain of my heart's too much, too bad to stay in sin. And so I started coming back to the Lord. I started talking to him daily in prayer. I started reading his word. And as I've done that now, uh, God has been chipping away at the misery and replacing it with slowly growing joy. And she said this, I cannot miss my daily prayer and Bible reading one day because if I do, I may be lost. Wow. I may go back to that old life and I just, it's too bad, too painful to go back to that. I liked what she said. I can't miss my daily prayer and Bible reading for a day because if I do, I might be lost. I might be done for she, I, I just saw her out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the water, with a, uh, with a uh, life preserver on her, and she was desperately clinging to that life preserver. Why, well, she, if she lets go of that life preserver, she's going to sink. She's going to drown. And that's, that's what Paul is saying. We should be holding fast to the head. Why? It's from him that we grow spiritually. And Paul's going to say, Therefore, as you receive Jesus as both Christ, the Messiah, the Redeemer, you depended on Him for your salvation. You relied on Him to, to uh, pardon you of your sins. And you also received Christ as the Lord. He's the Master. We don't tell Him how we're supposed to be living. He tells us. He gives us instructions in the Word. So walk in Him. Continue in your twofold relationship with Christ, uh, both as one that you continue to depend on and you continue to submit to. So Paul is dealing with a heresy in this epistle. And then he says, uh, I, want you to, I want you to walk, live in a manner worthy, suitable of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. Here's our objective in life, not to please ourselves, but to please Him. Bear, and so Paul, what is, it, what is a, a, a worthy walk? Bearing fruit in every good work. God wants to bear fruit in us, love, joy, peace, patience, the fruit of the Spirit, and He wants to bear fruit through us in the lives of others and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. Now, I want to sum up chapter 4 in one sentence. Here is chapter 4 uh, in essence. Evangelism is to be conducted by persistent prayer, wise conduct, and by gracious speech. And our passage breaks down like this. First six verses, evangelism. Seven through nine, Paul's current situation locked up in jail. But what's he doing there? He's doing this right here, evangelism. He's preaching. Who's his congregation? Just about the morally worst human beings on the face of the earth. If prisoners weren't bad, they wouldn't be prisoners. We're all sinners. We all do wrong. But, but those in prison, they do especially bad things. So there is his, there is his flock. Um, and then uh, he brings his epistle to an end with greetings, uh, exchange, and then final instructions. Okay, let's take your handout, please. I hope you have that handout. And we're going to begin chapter 4 in verse 1 we dealt with last week because the first verse in chapter 4 really goes with the topic we dealt with last week in chapter 3. So I want to begin now with verse 2. 
Verse 2 begins a short paragraph on evangelism, and evangelism is not so much talking to people about God, but first speaking to God about people who are lost. So he says, persist in prayer. That means be faithful, consistent, regular in prayer. Because you don't get answers, responses from God immediately, hold steady. Now, persistent prayer could lead to listless, listlessness. That is sleepy, weary minds. You persist in prayer. Sue and I used to kneel at our bed at night and pray, but we, I quit doing that with her because she'll start praying, and she's so tired. She quits praying. I wait for her to finish. I look at her. She's asleep. <laughs> and so a gentle elbow in the ribs. <laughs> Honey, wake up and finish, please. <laughs> so that's not the best place for Sue to pray. Uh, we, we, we don't do it that way anymore. So persistent prayer Remaining alert. See, that's what persistent prayer requires. A per, real prayer now, it can put us asleep. Persistent prayer, remaining alert in it with thankfulness. Now, what is it that we should be thankful for when it comes to prayer? Uh, thankful for past blessings bestowed. For God being near to hear us when we call out to Him. For the fact that God cares. For the truth that God is capable of helping and for anticipating a divine response from Him. Now, according to verse 2, we should pray with mind alert and heart thankful. According to verse 3, there's a third way to pray, and that's for the outreach of Paul and others in prison. So he says in verse 3, at the same time, praying also for us, me and my fellow Christian prisoners, that God would open to us an opportunity for the Word. Now, what is that door that Paul is praying for? that God would eventually open the prison, prison door and set me free to preach outside in public like I have been doing. But number two, while I'm still behind bars, pray that I will make the most of evangelizing my fellow inmates. So pray for us also that God would open to us an opportunity for the word, that is to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in prison. Now, uh, we have a figure of speech here called oxymoron. Uh, oxy, uh, moron. Uh, oxy means wise, and moron means foolish. <laughs> foolish. So oxymoron is a statement that at first seems really foolish, but when you think about it, it's quite profound. So where's the oxymoron uh, lie? Uh, what is said initially appears to be foolish, but upon further reflection, it's found to be extremely wise. Uh, he is called to evangelize people, to preach the gospel, but he's locked up in jail where he can't do that on the outside, in churches, in synagogues, on the mission field. He's called to preach, but now put by God in a place where his preaching is greatly reduced. But he can evangelize what open ears he's got, prisoners. Prison will also provide time to write the prison epistles which had been a huge blessing to thousands of people down through the centuries, like the one we're studying now. And his incarceration emboldens free Christians, those that are not locked up, to witness, since, he, since he's not on the outside doing it, like Paul says in Philippians chapter 1. Now, in verse 4, Paul makes two requests for himself, opportunities to speak the gospel and for the manner in which he is to preach it. And he's saying in verse for also pray that I might make it the gospel known as it is divinely determined for me to speak. Now, what does it mean that I should make the gospel known as, as it should be? That I, might, that I might strategically speak to the right person at the right time at a need that's critical in his life, and he's open to me. Pray that I'll be courageous about doing this. Can you imagine speaking the gospel in prison There'll be plenty of people to slap you in the face or tell you to shut up. I don't want to hear any of that kind of stuff. And if you don't, we'll beat you up. So I think there were times when he was threatened. Uh, pray that I'll be clear that I will be effective in what I am saying. So pray that I might make it known as it is divinely determined for me to, for me to speak. Now in verse 5, Paul turns from his evangelistic efforts to that of the Colossians. Now he wants them to do what he's doing, evangelizing. So he says in verse 5, Live wisely 
toward unbelievers. The Bible which unbelievers read daily is the life of a Christian. Live wisely. As I just said, the Bible read by them is the daily lives of believers. Live in such a way as to adorn, beautify the gospel and not discredit it. Prudently seize each chance given to witness. So live wisely toward those outside, those outside the church, those outside of Christ, unbelievers, seizing for yourselves every single opportunity. What is the opportunity that the Colossians are to seize and make the most of? That opportunity is the chance to give the gospel to an unbeliever. And notice what he says, seizing for yourselves every opportunity. What does he mean, seizing for yourselves? He means two things. If you don't seize these opportunities, these chances will be lost. Meaning, God's going to give you certain opportunities to speak to lost people that He doesn't give me. He doesn't give to anybody else. He's going to bring certain un unbelievers to you, not to other people. And if you don't seize the opportunities God gives you, they are down the drain. They are lost. And the second thing He means seizing for yourselves is, it is for your advantage to seize these opportunities. What a surprise. I thought it was for the advantage of the unbelievers that I witnessed to them. It is for their advantage, but it's for our good as well. And that may be why Proverbs 11 says, He who wins souls is wise. He's doing what God wants. He's going to be blessed by God. He's going to be handsomely recom recompensed by the Lord. So live wisely toward unbelievers. Seizing for yourselves every single opportunity. Now, I want to know, um, does God give you and me throughout the year opportunities to evangelize? Yes. Are those the only opportunities that God gives us? Chances to speak to unbelievers about Christ? No. He gives us opportunities in other areas of life. Like what? Being faithful in church. You're cultivating your relationship with the Lord by your daily prayers, daily Bible reading, your service in the church, your service outside the church, helping people, maybe on your job, in your neighborhood, spending time with people, etc. God gives us wonderful opportunities in the other areas of life. How do we feel when God gives us a golden opportunity served up on a silver platter and dropped right on our lap and we foolishly let it go through our fingers? How do we feel? We feel terrible about it. We've all had opportunities that we let get away from us, and opportunity carries a potential blessing. But opportunities are temporary. They're here just briefly, and then they vanish. They are gone. Let me illustrate lost opportunities. And uh, I've, I've, uh, you may have heard me say this before. What, did, what have I got right here? Baseball diamond. Uh, when our son Joseph was about, oh, three or four years old, he was in love with baseball. He was crazy about baseball. I, I was teaching him how to play. I'd pitch to him, teach him how to hit, how to throw. He would take his baseball equipment to bed and sleep with it. And one night I went into a dark bedroom to give him a kiss on the cheek, and I ended up kissing the baseball bat he was snuggled up to. And so one day I said, Joseph, I want to spend some time with you alone, just you and me together, nobody else. What do you want to do? You want to stay here at the house? You want to go somewhere? And he said, Daddy, I want you to take me to a baseball game. Now, we lived in Virginia where they have a professional minor league baseball team called the Lynchburg Mets, owned and operated by the New York Mets. And they happened to be playing in town that night. So uh, as we were driving to the stadium to see the ball game, Joseph said, Daddy, tonight I want you to catch a foul ball, F-O-U-L. Now, you know in baseball that a batter has to hit the ball between the third and first base lines. It's a fair ball. He can advance the base. But if he hits the ball outside the third uh, and first base lines, it, the ball is F-O-U-L, foul. He, the batter cannot reach a base on a, on a foul ball. And in professional baseball, when spectators catch a foul ball, they get to keep it. And Joseph had noticed before at other games I'd caught, taken him to that when a fan, a spectator, caught a foul ball, they put it in their pocket and they took it home. So he said, Daddy, you, I want you to catch a foul baseball and give it to me. Now, of the hundreds of ball games that I've been to before, not once had a foul baseball ever been hit to me. But on this particular night, not only was I supposed to have a foul ball hit to me, I was supposed to catch it as well. 
So my question was, well, how do you draw lightning if you want to? And uh, for the first six innings, Joseph and I sit right behind home plate. It's impossible to catch a ball here. There's a, there's a wire screen that protects spectators sitting here when the pitcher throws a ball and the batter hits it and it comes back to the screen. And then there was a roof over the head to keep the rain off. And I uh, said, Joseph, we're not going to catch a foul ball sitting here. And, and while we were here, he said another two or three times. Now, Daddy, remember why we're here tonight so you can catch a foul ball and give it to me. And I thought, oh, if he mentions a foul ball one more time, I'm going to scream. So I said, Joseph, we're not going to catch a foul ball here. And I'd seen in those first six innings baseballs hit in the bleachers of the foul territory right field. And I said, Joseph, let's go out and sit in those bleachers. Maybe a ball will be hit to us. So we went out there for the last three innings. In those last three innings, I offered a free earnest prayer. Oh, God, please have a batter hit me a foul ball. My little boy's got his heart set on it. In fact, I'm beginning to want that ball worse than he is. And several times as we were out there, balls were hit to the right fielder in fair territory. And Joseph said, there's a ball, Daddy, run out there and get that. Joseph, I can't go out on the field of fair play. Why not? Well, the, the security will throw us out of the ballpark. There won't be any, uh, we, won't, we, 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 won't, we can't do that. And so when the last inning came, I offered up my third prayer. Oh, Lord, uh, please have somebody hit me a foul ball. And I wasn't praying for the salvation of people. I wasn't praying that God would keep America from going down the drain. I was praying about something a lot more important, a foul ball. And the, the last inning came, and the Lynchburg Mets sent to the, uh, a pinch hitter to the plate named Joe Redfield. Now, someday I'm going to meet Joe Redfield. And you know what he did? He had a foul ball. To whom did it come? Me. And when he hit that ball, I said, Joseph, here it comes. And he and I sprang to our feet, and I got ready to catch that ball. And as that ball was dropping out of the air, I knew that, pre that ball was the, uh, the answer to three earnest prayers. And the closer it got to me, sure enough, I saw it had my son's name written on it. And I got prepared to catch it. Now, I saw as the ball was dropping, I had to take one step forward and one step to the left to get directly under it. And as the ball was dropping out of the sky, the thought came, it has been 20 years since you played baseball. You surely don't think you're going to catch that ball now, especially with thousands of people in the stands watching to see if you do. And all of a sudden, I, I lost confidence in my ability to catch. Now you ask, could you have caught that ball? Let me tell you, growing up as a high school student, I was an all-star center fielder. Catching flies was my specialty. I could have caught, I was so good at catching flies, I could catch them in my back pocket. And I could have caught this. It wasn't a scorching line drive that's too hot to handle. It was a lazy pop the can your grandmother could catch. But I lost confidence in my ability. And because I did, I lost a second to take a step forward and a step to the left to get under it. The ball hit the ground on a rebound. I made a stab for it. It went right over my palm. I turned and looked to see where it went. On the first bounce, it went straight into the hands of a man my age who took it and gave to his son about the age of my son. I looked at Joseph's face. What did I see? Oh, he was so disappointed. I couldn't apologize enough. Joseph, I am so sorry. He was, he was really sweet. He said, that's okay, Daddy. You give me one next time. Next time. You mean we got to go through this again? All the way home, I apologized. And he probably thought, oh, if Dad apologizes one more time, I'm going to be the one to scream. I went home and poured my heart out to Sue. She tried to make me feel good. She said, you know, it's a good thing you didn't catch that ball. And I said, why? She said, you didn't have a glove. You might have broken a, hand, a bone in your hand. I said, oh, nonsense. So I, I caught lots of balls barehanded going up as a kid. I never had a problem with that. The worst part of this ordeal, ordeal I, I just couldn't go to sleep for an hour. I kept seeing in my mind's eye that baseball dropping out of the air. And I braided myself. You prayed three times. God sent you a, a baseball. You could have caught it. You unjustly lost your confidence, your ability to catch. And now look, your, your son's going to, to bed tonight broken hearted about that baseball. The next day, she got smart. She took Joseph to the store and brought him a brand new baseball. He, he got over the disappointment. It took me a while to get over the dis disappointment. My point is when God provides you and me with wonderful opportunities and we don't seize them, we forfeit that potential blessing. It gets away from us, and we can have remorse for years, if not a lifetime. We shouldn't assume this, but sometimes God resends that, that opportunity back to us. I miss that baseball in Virginia. Moody asked me to join the faculty. We moved down here. One day I was in the middle of Chicago telling some businessmen about missing that baseball, and they all laughed about it. One of those businessmen didn't bother to tell me 
His older brother was the first baseman on the Lynchburg Mets, the team that I took Joseph to. He contacted his older brother, had, jo had him send Joseph an, a baseball autograph to all the players on the team. When I gave it to Joseph, he held it up and said, Daddy, this baseball's a lot better than the one you missed. How's that? <laughs> He said, the one you missed didn't have anybody's autograph. Look, this one has everybody's autograph. Boy, Daddy, am I glad you missed that baseball. <laughs> so what does he say? Seize for yourself most of the opportunities. Some of the opportunities. No, every opportunity. Now, verse 6 gives a specific example of wise conduct. And this example is that of appropriate speech. Your speech is to always be characterized with wisdom and graciousness. Now, why does he link salt with wisdom? Well, back then they didn't have refrigeration to preserve meat. You sprinkled it with salt. Salt preserved the meat so it wouldn't spoil and go bad. Wisdom preserves our daily speech from going bad, from being inappropriate. So your speech must, all, must, be, must always be characterized with wisdom and graciousness so, you, so that you know how to respond to every person. Such speech is attractive, pleasant, and winsome and influential. Uh, Michelle, at age 32, told me she had lived 32 years in deep unhappiness and misery until a friend of hers, Shirley, she had been noticing Shirley's joy and peace and wanted that for herself, but didn't know how to get it until Shirley made a statement one day that Michelle says just unlocked the mystery. And I saw clearly it, what she had came from Christ. And I needed the Jesus that she had. And Michelle became a wonderful Christian. She was converted, so to speak, through Shirley's wise conduct. Now, the readers are naturally concerned for the apostle. After all, he's taking time to minister to them through his epistle, even though he's in prison. And so they want to know about his situation. Verse 7, regarding all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother, and I want you to remember those, those two words, beloved brother and reliable servant and fellow prisoner in the Lord will inform you. A uh, fellow prisoner, probably, now this is an interpretation commentators are divided, probably he was bound in service to Christ not bound in prison by Caesar, but it's possible he was both bound to service in Christ and bound in prison uh, by Caesar like Paul was. Now verse 8 tells why Paul is sending Tychicus to Colossae, whom I am sending to you for this very purpose, that you may learn of our circumstances and that he may cheer your hearts. So for this very purpose, two, two reasons I'm sending him. First of all, to bring you guys up to speed on my situation in prison, and secondly, to encourage and lift your sagging spirits. Now, verse 9 tactfully informs the Colossians of the return home of Anisiphorus, whom they may resent for running away uh, and stealing from his, their, his master, Philemon, whom, who is also a member of the church. So now Paul is going to mention in closing this letter three questionable people. Three quest, uh, que, uh, questionable, doubtful uh, believers that he is uh, ill at ease with, that he is uncertain of, and one is Onesimus. Now, Onesimus was from the Colossians church. Philemon was in the Colossian church. Everybody knew that, that Onesimus was, uh, a fellow, was a former slave owned by Philemon, and he stole from Philemon and ran away. And in the providence of God, God put him in prison where he met Paul, and Paul led him to Christ. And now Onesimus is being released from, prisoner, from prison, and Paul is saying, I'm sending this fellow back to you. Notice what he says in verse 9. Uh, so verse 8, I'm sending Tychicus to you. Verse 9, along with Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother. Now look up at verse 7. He, what does he say about Tychicus? Our beloved brother who is one of you. They will inform you about the whole situation here. Now beginning in verse 10, Paul passes on greetings from other Christians to the Colossians. Aristarchus, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner of war, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, Barnabas's cousin. 
about whom you received instructions, if he visits you, welcome him. Well, here is a second questionable person, John Mark. And remember what, ha what some Christians had against him? He went on to the mission field with Paul and Barnabas. It was too hard for, for John Mark. He didn't like it. He bailed out and went back. And the next time uh, Barnabas wanted to go to the mission field with Paul, Paul said, yeah, well, I'll go with you, but, but Mark's not going with us. And so they disagreed with each other. And so uh, most Christians knew that he abandoned Paul on the mission field. But Paul is saying, uh, no, I, I want you to well. If he comes to Colossae, I want you to welcome him. And in verse 11, a third man greets the Colossians. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only co-workers for God's kingdom who are from the circumcision. They are such who have proven to, to be a comfort to me. Uh, now why? In contrast to most Jews who had rejected Paul and the Christian gospel, these few Jewish men had embraced Christ. Um, in fact, look at Acts 28. When Paul went to Rome to be imprisoned, the Jews heard he was coming. And they contacted Paul. And they said, we've heard a lot about you, your missionary endeavors for Christianity. We think you're wrong. We think you're a heretic. But we Jews want to meet with you on a certain day, and we want to hear you out. What are you preaching? Have you abandoned Judaism and become a Christian? And so Paul met with them. At the end of the day, most of the Jews said, we don't care for the gospel you preach. There were a handful of the Jews who did. And so he says, uh, at the end of the day, and disagreeing among themselves, see, the, the Jewish people, some liked what Paul said, some didn't, most didn't. They departed after Paul had made one statement. Now Paul's going to quote Isaiah. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand, you will indeed see but never perceive, for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and, and with their eyes they have, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. In other words, they didn't want to accept Christ. If he offered the forgiveness of sin, they didn't want that. They were determined not to become Christian. Therefore, Paul ends by saying, Let it be known to you that, the salva that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They'll listen. You Jew the majority of you Jewish people, turn your back on the Messiah. You don't want the salvation he offers. Then we're going to the Gentiles. They will accept it. Now, I can remember Marsha Matskovitz telling me, now this is, I didn't know this. She said the last thing a Jewish person thinks he will ever become is a Christian. So when you hear a Jewish person say, I'm a Christian, probably he is a genuine Christian because it's so hard for him to come to that decision, to turn his back on the religion we were raised in and to accept what we've been taught is pure heresy. It's nonsense. Stay away from Christians. You know, Christians had a bad reputation among the Jews in early Christianity because the Christians persecuted the Jews. Why did they persecute them? You guys slew the Messiah. Well, we ought to beat you up and slay you too. And so we Christians have not uh, had a real good reputation among the Jews for most of church history. So these few handful of Jewish converts have been a real comfort to Paul. Now, the fourth man sending greetings is well known to the readers. He is their pastor. Epaphras sends his greetings. He is one of you, a servant of Christ, always laboring intensely for you in his prayers, requesting that you may appear mature now and ultimately morally perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. And in verse 13, Paul personally personally confirms Epaphras as one who labors intensely for the Colossians. For I bear him witness. Now why is he, why is he speaking so well of uh, this pastor Epaphras? Epaphras uh, uh, deserves the commendation. Paul's right in everything he's saying. Epaphras works to refute the local heresy, and he wants to validate Epaphras' ministry, and he best knows the heresy's perils. To validate the ministry of Epaphras. 
you wouldn't think that since Ephesus is such a fine, faithful, Christian servant, that there'd be some people in the church that, that didn't like him. They didn't think he, they knew, he knew what he was talking about. And so Paul validates this man. Now, the two final other men send greetings. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings along with Demas. Now, I want to point out that everybody Paul mentions in this chapter is commended in some way by Paul except one person. Here he is. And later, this is what Paul says about Demas. For Demas has forsaken me because he fell in love with this present world and departed for Thessalonica. Only Luke is with me. Now notice what he says about John Mark who, who uh, dropped out of the mission trip. Take Mark and bring him with you for he is profitable to me for the ministry. What Paul is saying is, uh, I was really hurt and disappointed when this young man abandoned me and Barnabas on the mission field, but he's repented of that sin. He has borne fruit and is a faithful servant, and now he is very helpful to me in the ministry, and so please bring him with me. But I think with Demas, uh, Paul doesn't say anything good about him, but I, I just sense Paul's beginning to recognize this man's heart is turning less and less from the Lord and more and more to the wall, to the, to the world. And Paul's probably had a number of talks with him. There have been young men that I would call in to my office at Moody, and I would say, I want to know what's going on in your life. Well, why, are you ask, why are you asking, Dr. Sauer? Because what I'm seeing in you in class and outside of class is not good. And I know something is amiss. Can you tell me what that is? And I think Paul undoubtedly recognized something was not right with Demas, and when he finally defected, Paul wasn't surprised at all. Verse 15, Paul now sends his own greetings. Please extend my greetings to those brethren from Laodicea and especially to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. Now, lastly, verse 16, final instructions. And when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of uh, the Laodiceans. Exchange letters that I'm writing. Both those... I'm saying certain things to the church at Laodicea. I'm not saying to you, it may be helpful to you. I'm saying certain things to uh, you Colossians that I'm not saying to the Laodiceans. So exchange uh, letters. And you, must, and you must yourselves also read the letter that is coming from Laodicea. Verse 17, tell Archippus. Now Archippus is filling in as the pastor while Epaphras is in Rome consulting with Paul. Tell Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you received for the Lord. You must finish it. Well, let's read between the lines. I think Archippus is, for some reason, having a hard time pastoring the church at Colossae in the, in the place of efforts, and he's on the verge of quitting. And what Paul is saying is, don't you dare quit that ministry until God makes it clear it is finished. You've done your job. Now you may quit. Verse 18, this great in I, Paul, write with my own hand, please remember my bonds, in, uh, my imprisonment, may grace be with you. Um, now, uh, why is he writing with his own hand? Well, he did that in uh, 2 Thessalonians. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. So for the most part, Paul had a secretary called an amanuensis. He would dictate the letter to the church at Thessalonica, to the church at Colossae, and his, his amanuensis, his secretary, would write it. And then toward the end, Paul would take the letter and write the final verse with his own hand because most people could recognize his handwriting. Okay, by way of application, several things. Evangelism is our duty and privilege. We are divinely commanded to tell others the good news of Christ. Now, you probably know the person whom God used to bring the gospel to you. How do you feel about that person? Oh, you're grateful to that individual that witnessed to you, wrote that tract, wrote that hymn, preached that sermon, wrote that scripture that you read. Or maybe that person was your mother or your older brother. You're grateful to whomever that is. We want to be one of, the, one of those that brings the gospel to other people, and they are grateful for God using us in their life. Secondly, evangelism begins with prayer. 
prior to speaking to people about Christ, speak to Christ about these lost people. Lord, lead the right lost people across my path. Prepare their hearts before they ever appear with me. Open their ears to hear what I've got to say. You speak, bar my lips. You speak to them through me. Third, the evangelism is greatly enhanced by wise character and conduct. Such are, such are attracting, winsome, and influential. Walking in wisdom opens ears and hearts to the gospel. Paul often prayed that God would give him chances to witness. He also asked the rank and file believers to pray for his witness. Paul prudently kept the churches informed of his circumstances, ministry, and needs. And I like what he says. Remember my bonds. The chief of the apostles leaned appropriately on the rank and file common ordinary Christians to pray for him. He knew that only they could lay hold of God's power for him. Now, Paul was the chief of the apostles. He was like a five-star general in the army. You and I are like privates and corporals in the army. But he had valued the prayers of common, ordinary Christians. Only they, of all the people on the earth, could lay hold of God's power to help Paul. So, Lord, we thank you for the ongoing ministry of Paul through this letter. He wrote it when in prison. He didn't deserve to be there, but you put him there in your wisdom. And you gave him a fruitful ministry in that prison that still is being failed today. Now may we take Colossians to heart, make us aware of heresy, whatever the origin, whatever the nature of it. May we be able to detect it and avoid it like the plague. Help us since we have died to sin and been raised with Christ to seek those things above. Help us, Lord, to, put, to set our mind on things above and not on things of the earth. Help us to hold fast to you, Jesus, so that we grow appropriately and become the witnesses you want us to be and that we possess all the blessings that you have for us. Help us as you undoubtedly help the Colossians. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.